Hello, everybody. Great uh, to uh, see you on this webinar with us today. Uh, we will be just waiting for a few minutes for everybody to join, and then we will start with our today's presentation. Already more than a hundred people in the first minute. We'll just wait for one more. Okay, so I suppose uh, we can start. Uh, again, greetings, everyone. Today, uh, uh, we uh, will be hosting a joint webinar with uh, Darkal, and uh, we are joined by uh, Mr. David Alley, the CEO. And uh, the topic will be uh, countering illegal trade on darknet marketplaces, or uh, more broadly, uh, dark web research in general. So, uh, David, I suppose that uh, you uh -huh. uh, could uh, tell us a bit uh, about sure. Darkal. Absolutely. And it's really great to be here. And thank you for everyone for joining from, from all around the world. I know that uh, we always uh, fight the various different time zones to get everyone here. So a uh, uh, special thanks to the, the Social Links team for, uh, for hosting this webinar. Uh, they've, done, uh, they've been really, really super helpful in, in getting this uh, uh, this excellent presentation together for us today. So uh, a little bit about us at Dark Gal. We are an American company, and our headquarters is in Denver, Colorado, uh, also known as the Mile High City. Um, we originally started off uh, way back when as a, as a cybersecurity company with a focus on penetration testing. And uh, we were, at that time, we would do research on, um, on the dark net to kind of see if we could find credentials to help us with our pin testing work. And we were really successful at that. We had a really high rate of penetrations for the pin test. And we said, well, why don't we change this and like actually go into being just a pure darknet company only? And that was really the, the birth of Dark Owl and what we did. And so we, uh, since that time, we've uh, had a lot of great team members uh, with us at Dark Owl. And we've built a, a very good collection capability uh, for us to go onto the darknet and pull out that really difficult data to get to. Uh, we have a, a great collections team uh, that, that, that does all this hard work and makes it much easier for our partners like Social Links to do the next part, which is to, you know, once they've looked at that data, to, to make sense of it and decide, well, what does it mean? And, well, how do we use it? And how do we fight, you know, crime uh, that is emanating from, from the dark net? So it's... Um, uh, we have a couple of claims to fame. Um, I guess the, the one we use the most is that uh, we have the largest commercially available uh, uh, darknet uh, data lake in the world. And that's just because we've been doing it longer than everyone else. And uh, we've had some very, very special team members over the years that had very uh, unique access and understanding of the Tor network. Uh, we actually, at one point, we had the uh, co-founder of Tor on our team. And so it's, uh, it's a really, really uh, unique company uh, in what we've got. Uh, we are uh, highly niche and highly skilled. And that's why great companies like Social Links and us like to work together because we're very uh, complementary. Now, uh, we do have, you know, uh, we work a lot with OSINT Analyst uh, as well. But we also uh, provide APIs and data feeds uh, for partners. And that's, that's how we work with Social Links. And I think you're going to be pretty amazed at what the, the team has to show you today. I'm always impressed uh, with what they're able to come up with. Uh, they just have a superior team and uh, leveraging uh, great data from Dark Owl with great analysts from Social Links. You'll always be happy with the results. So 
Uh, with that, I'll turn that back over to you, Ivan. Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, the introduction, David. Uh, so uh, yes, <clears throat> a bit about us. Uh, the company was founded in 2015. We have 80 plus employees at the moment with the HQ in the US and uh, EU offices in Netherlands and the R&D one in uh, Riga, Latvia. Uh, what we do is we provide uh, software for data-driven investigations. Uh, you can see, uh, well, mm, uh, you, you can see that uh, we have uh, a good rating on Gartner Peer Insights and uh, that we have had a number of industrial awards in the past years. Uh, so here uh, we have a very brief slide about the average uh, pricing of uh, various goods on the dark web, uh, ranging from stolen credit cards uh, to out-of-the-box ransomware trojans. Uh, and, uh, the, well, a concept that uh, I'm sure uh, everybody is familiar with is that there is a division into what is known as uh, the clear web or the surface web, something which is indexed by conventional search engines. Then there is the deep web, uh, which can include uh, many different things uh, that are not, uh, and uh, that it takes a bit more effort to find. And there is the space commonly known as the dark web, which includes the Tor network, but also additional ones uh, such as I2P, Freenet, and ZeroNet. Uh, the general principle of the, the work of uh, the Tor browser is that the traffic goes uh, through uh, from the user through several nodes and then uh, reaches a specific server at the end. Uh, the uh, current uh, total Tor network bandwidth is uh, uh, 400 gigabit per second. Uh, and here we see an infographic from 2009 to 2021 uh, with its growth. One of the technologies that is also uh, utilized quite often within the platforms of communication is uh, PGP encryption. Uh, the basic concepts being that the user uh, sends an encrypted message that can only be accessed and read with the use of a private key held by the recipient. Now, here uh, we can see the boost of Darknet Marketplace's revenue from uh, 2011 with the first precedent, precedent, the Silk Road, to 2020, which is quite substantial, as you can see here. Uh, the products and services available on those marketplaces uh, range from drugs to tutorials, uh, forgery, uh, various kinds of illicit services, malware, hosting, and fraud, uh, the majority of those being drugs. Uh, the general principle of how a marketplace works is that a buyer exchanges currency for uh, any a kind of specific cryptocurrency accepted by the marketplace, uh, which uh, is predominantly Bitcoin at this moment, but there is uh, a shift towards alternative uh, ones such as uh, Monero or Zcash. Uh, the buyer uh, then uh, transfers the Bitcoin into the market's account and uh, makes a purchase. Uh, the crypto is further held in the market's escrow account until the order is finalized with the market taking the commission. After, after uh, the finalization of the deal, the vendor is paid. Uh, then the vendor may move the Bitcoin from the market account and potentially exchange it into FIAT. Here we see an infographic of uh, types of entities receiving Bitcoin from dark web sources. Uh, which can be uh, <clears throat> KYC and for uh, exchanges enforcing KYC or exchanges uh, more <laughs> liberal with their KYC processes. Uh, those can also be mic uh, mixing services and other entity types. Um, David, uh, if yeah. you could potentially tell us about yeah. the differentiation. 
Absolutely. So, you know, as uh, you know, as we've seen here, you know, we're we're talking a lot about you know the crypto piece, and we want to talk about like how Dark Owl differentiates itself and and helps you with this. And it's because we're able to go into these markets uh, that we're talking about today, and we're able to pull that data out for you. So uh, a lot of the blockchain tools that you'll be familiar with uh, will allow you to see uh, various different uh, wallets as they're being tumbled and, you know, where they've been mixed or how they're being, exp uh, you know, exploited. But what they have a difficulty doing is showing you is tying a wallet to a very specific uh, illegal activity. And that's one of the main things that makes us different for these types of investigations. Uh, we're continuously out there uh, crawling uh, these darknet sites and these markets that we are in. We're in uh, many, many of the markets and someone asks a question, you know, how do we differ from some of our competitors? And it's just a, it's a real a question of scale and scope. Uh, where you know many of them are in about 400 sites, uh, we're in you know we're collecting on over 95,000 sites and about another 20 to 30,000 mirrors every day. So it's just this this massive amount of unmatched darknet content discovery that we've got, and inside of that content is where all of these uh, cryptocurrency wallets are, and it'll be directly tied to you know here you want to buy your MDMA in London. Here you go. You can buy it here. Use this, you know, this Bitcoin wallet or this Monero wallet. And, and I second uh, the comments that you know we're seeing a, ch a shift from Bitcoin into some of the other coins as well uh, out there. So, uh, in addition to being able to look at what's happening today uh, with those coins, and even we'll pick up coins uh, in our collection that um, that are not even on the chain yet. They're brand new wallets that are being used, and it's a we're seeing that shift uh, away from. Uh, the traditional way of like using the same wallet over and over to uh, criminals will create a, a new wallet, put it up on the site for their drugs or their uh, their CSAM material or whatever it is they're trying to sell and have the, the payments into there before uh, the blockchain tools can even detect them. Uh, and so that helps. But then you'll see coins get recycled. And because of our unique archival capability that goes back, you know, almost nine years worth of data, you can also do those deep investigations on darknet on um, uh, darknet transactions that happened years ago, and so all of that together, you know, gives you the type of content that makes it a, a very very strong. And that combined with the ability to do link analysis that you'll see from from our social links partners is a very very powerful tool. So uh, to give you an idea of what we actually have in the collection, if we can get the next slide, please. It's about the numbers, right? And, you know, it's a lot of Tor because Tor is the largest of the dark nets. Uh, we also have a very large collection from I2P and also from Zernet. And those are the, the three major dark nets that we collect on. Um, and there's very, some technical reasons behind that. Uh, but uh, that's the, the dark nets that we collect on. Uh, we also are having uh, a lot of success picking up uh, cryptocurrency transactions off of Telegram channels and Discord channels. Uh, as we know, Telegram is very popular with a lot of different uh, hacking groups and black hat hacking groups. It's easier to use than a darknet channel. Uh, the same way with Discord, uh, as we see that a lot of uh, hackers are also gamers and they use Discord for the communications for that. We see some in, in, in paste as well, uh, but the number one should really focus on is in the lower right hand corner. You know, that's 347 million cryptocurrency wallets pulled out of our darknet collection. It's pretty, it's a pretty big number. And you, you keep focusing on that. And every time I see a cryptocurrency wallet on a darknet site, uh, it's always doing something bad. So I'd say it's a 99.9% .9 probability that, you know, if you're using social links and you pull out a cryptocurrency wallet from the darknet data, you've already done one of the hardest steps, which is identifying some form of suspicious activity. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to our social links partners to take you through the rest of the demo. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, also uh, it, the, it may make sense to note with the Telegram and uh, Discord channels that there is indeed a substantial overlap. Uh, well, much more substantial, obviously, than uh, with- uh, Absolutely. 
the the traditional mainstream social media platforms uh, te uh telegram and discord aren't really called social media but they have uh, a significant social networking element and uh, telegram especially in the past few years uh, and uh, it's not, uh, it is about uh, cyber crime groups, uh, uh, but also apart from that, uh, it could just be uh, local or regional or even macro regional uh, drug vendors, uh, or it could be people engaged into child grooming, especially on Discord or extremist groups, as we previously covered on our, one of our webinars with uh, uh, a German expert on extremism research. Uh, so yes, now we will go into the actual uh, examples that uh, we have. So first, uh, we uh, may spend a few minutes to talk about the method uh, of dark web research. Here, that would be focused on researching an individual. So there uh, could be several directions. Well, it, it may make sense to use all of this in conjunction. Uh, it is the username uh, which, uh, from which uh, we can also get the specific platform within this interface uh, where uh, the uh, vendor or uh, forum uh, member is present. Uh, that can also uh, give us insights into their stated or observed affiliations. Uh, those are the payment methods, uh, the posts and threads, and the products. Uh, so, of course, from the posts and threads, uh, you can examine the topics discussed and the details, which can also uh, tell you more about uh, what exactly uh, they are doing, what kind of merchandise are they dealing in, what kind of categories. Do they have a specific focus? It is uh, the speech patterns, uh, the idioms and idiosyncrasies uh, used by the individual. And it is the shipping locations. And of course, the products also tells us more obviously about the product categories. And sometimes product cards can contain contact details within them. Now, uh, entities, well, objects within this schema, such as the speech patterns, the uh, stated shipping locations of the products uh, and the affiliations and the specific platform can point us to assumptions about a certain region or macro region. For example, uh, there is a higher probability of a vendor or forum member uh, on, a, on an Eastern European marketplace to be from somewhere in Eastern Europe. Uh, then payment methods can be uh, different. Uh, those can be various types of uh, e-money, but here we'll focus more on the cryptocurrency addresses. And uh, a transactional graph derived from an address can uh, tell us about the interactions it has uh, with other addresses or groups of those, and uh, tell us about uh, the services uh, that they are using, such as mixers or exchanges. A, mix, a mixing service may also have uh, uh, theoretically, uh, some kind of interaction, some kind of partnership program with a specific marketplace. Uh, and also, they can be mentioned in uh, various reports uh, or forums. Uh, all of those can possibly lead us to digital breadcrumbs. Uh, and that, in conjunction with uh, the assessment of the presence of the user in other forums and marketplaces, and the way their personality may be reflected in their online behavior, and the kinds of merchandise that they are dealing in and the kind of payment methods that they are using uh, is all part of an attempt to create a digital profile of an individual. Now, here we will start with a first example where we will go from an alias. We will run our first transform to search for users under this alias. Here, uh, we can see some details in the properties, one of those uh, being the site name Tochka Market. Uh, Tochka is a Russian word standing for point or place. Uh, and so we search for the products related to this vendor. And we also extract their PGP open key 
which is quite often used by the vendors. Next, from the products, we will extract the locations they are stated to be shipped to and from. Uh, we can see here that those are mostly recreational drugs uh, shipped to the United States. I see there are some questions coming already. Uh, we will answer them uh, after, well, uh, the uh, whole demo part. So now from a PGP open key, it is sometimes possible for us to go to the email address, not in 100% of cases, as it can also be said about some of the other methods that we will be applying here. Here we see a Gmail. And from that, we can further try to see whether there is any uh, social media profiles, any accounts uh, connected to uh, that email address. And also there is a possibility to get the reviews if it's a Gmail account. We can see that there are accounts within Facebook, Firefox, uh, Gravatar, Pinterest, Samsung, and Twitter uh, connected to the email. And we see several profiles within Gravatar, LinkedIn, and Skype, from which we can, of course, extract additional details. And we, in the reviews, we also see a cannabis dispensary seemingly located in the United States and a bar in Cameroon, which matches with the location that we see here within the LinkedIn account, Halifa Black, connected to the Gmail address. Now, there is also a post uh, promoting the sale of marijuana on a surface web source stated by the account holder to be safe and secure. Now here we can use some of the Maltigo functionality to go into more data about that specific domain. And the who is data uh, gives us the name of Tabin Difon as the registrant and the company name of Halifa Ads. Uh, Tabi and Halifa are both something that we have seen within the social media footprint derived from the email address. Now, of course, uh, an analyst uh, won't be as lucky as in this instance in 100% of cases, but uh, this is real data related to a real individual, a real vendor. So it is something that is possible because uh, people do tend to make mistakes. Now we will go through another alias. This gives us four accounts with the same username. And it's something that uh, vendors tend to do uh, to maintain their commercial reputation with the customer base. So now we can ask for the specific platforms. We can see the Dread Forum, uh, the Hub Forum, and the Apollon Market, and also the Wall Street Market. Now uh, we also see a single PGP open key used by three out of four of those accounts. And we will further ask for the posts and products. We can see that there is uh, a certain uh, focus on Europe. Uh, in this instance, that uh, the goods are more likely shipped from Europe to locations worldwide. And the principles of working uh, with the posts are quite similar uh, to the way that uh, a user of uh, Social Links Pro or, well, a Sockman tool in general uh, can work with social graphs. So the graphs of social interactions within the digital space. From each of those, we go into the thread. From the thread, uh, we can go to the other posts within it and the other users that have been participating in those conversations. 
Now, this is, of course, just the stage of gathering data and uh, uh, an analyst working on uh, a real case uh, will, of course, face uh, the necessity to analyze this communication in depth. And that's why there's uh, a capability here to download the content within those posts, the text content as a zip archive. Now, here we see a Proton Mail account, nick of five at protonmail.ch. Uh, so mm, they seem to be more conscious about their digital footprint and their security, uh, but uh, potentially we can try to search for this alias in the social media platforms available. And here we'll try with an Eastern European platform because Kalashnikov is obviously a reference to the famous assault rifle. And here we get an account with just a cat as a picture under the name Nikolai Voronin. And uh, while it's not something that will state and something that we will accuse this person of, uh, but uh, it could be a coincidence or it could not be a coincidence. And the account is not very informative and is closed and has a profile picture of a cat. So here we're less lucky than in the first example. In some instances, uh, it's even more obscure. So here we see an individual uh, with the alias Bouchard Germany focusing on the European Union and two email addresses and, and a statement in uh, the product description that there is a possibility to contact the vendor on Discord. And we do see that there is a Discord account uh, connected to their Proton mail address and also a Skype account, uh, which uh, states the location of Germany. Now, this is all on the level of uh, analyzing people, analyzing individuals or small groups of people because uh, several individuals can be behind one username, of course. Uh, this can also be done on a macro level. Uh, so we can take uh, a number of capital cities or countries within a certain macro region, such as Asia Pacific or Latin America, uh, and uh, run a search uh, into the full spectrum of um, dark web sources available to us uh, to see uh, which products are shipped to and from those locations. And here we see that some countries have more activity within the spectrum of available sources. Some countries have less, and uh, we can potentially uh, look for um, vendors that are uh, focused on two or three specific countries at once. And we can also see which marketplaces are the more active within a given region. So here, and the same uh, is the case for Latin America, the Tochka market uh, is quite active. Uh, also the Apollon and Nightmare markets and several other ones have much, much less activity. Uh, now, of course, uh, it makes sense to uh, talk a bit about the cryptocurrency aspect. Uh, within dark web research. Uh, so, well, several of those graphs actually are something that we've shared previously uh, off topic on some of our previous webinars, uh, including this here. So uh, the methods could be split into sets of passive intelligence and direct engagement. Uh, and passive intelligence may include open source and social media intelligence, the traditional following the money approach, and the enrichment of the initial inner data that uh, the analyst or uh, potentially a victim of a crime may have. And direct engagement is something that implies uh, using custom digital avatars for social engineering. Uh, and also in case with enterprises uh, or state organizations, offensive security procedures uh, or threat intelligence. So uh, some of those methods are more customary to um, uh, certain kinds of professionals, certain kinds of analysts, certain kinds of organizations than other ones. Uh, but uh, in the end, as is the case with any kind of investigation, uh, it's all about uh, connecting the dots, the seemingly not connected entities in a broad sense of that word. So here, 
is a small reflection of the situation in uh, the uh, Bitcoin eco ecosystem. There are a number of addresses here, some of those belonging to uh, militant extremist groups, such as the Palestinian al qassam brigades or the Hayat al sham operating in Syria, some of those to dark web vendors, uh, such as uh, Ross Ulbricht, uh, the founder of Silk Road, Alexandra Kazas, the founder of Alpha Bay, or the administration of the Wall Street market that has exit scammed in 2019. Uh, some of those to law enforcement, some of those to uh, ransomware groups, and some of those to legitimate exchanges. Uh, now, a way to perform this attribution to be 100% uh, certain that uh, a specific address uh, belongs to a specific individual or a group uh, is to run searches into the social media and dark web space and also into data massives uh, that uh, are provided by uh, vendors uh, such as Darkal. And I must say that Darkal provides uh, a fasc fascinating uh, amounts of information of fascinating depth. So uh, a number of this uh, was found with uh, the help of Darkal as well. Uh, and uh, social links uh, is focused specifically on the Tor network, while Darkal, as David has uh, mentioned, uh, also pulls data from um, other sources, uh, such as I2P and ZeroNet. And once you get uh, this kind of entity, uh, you can run, a, uh, you can further run a transform to get the details and uh, then examine uh, the contents of those entities. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the source of uh, the network and the date and time are also stated within the properties. Now, here uh, we have uh, another uh, simple example of building a timeline uh, with the timestamps from within the transactions related to a specific address and uh, the timestamps of <laughs> Uh, the mentions of that address on a dark web forum. So here, all of this is related to the situation around the exit scam performed by the Wall Street Market Administration. And we can see that all of the transactions and all of the posts take place in the second half of April 2019. Uh, now, mm, if we talk about profiling, then there, we, uh, I must say that there are a number of uh, quite famous cases uh, that have been solved in, well, all of those uh, with, uh, by uh, law enforcement and uh, by analysts within those types of organizations related to uh, de-anonymizing uh, an owner or a senior administrator of a dark web marketplace. So there is, of course, the famous Ross Albrecht, uh, who was also using the uh, alias uh, Dread Pirate Roberts and uh, a clear web alias uh, Altoid, which was uh, the key thing that uh, has uh, led the American law enforcement towards them. Uh, and uh, we can gather the different data from the full spectrum of sources, uh, or potentially we could uh, very carefully, very in-depth, uh, try to profile the individual uh, based on uh, the way they interact with the customers, the way they interact with vendors, the way they behave online within the platform. Uh, or we uh, can, um, which is a more complicated topic, of course, that goes uh, somewhat out of the scope of today's event, uh, profile, try to profile those people in retrospect to see what is common uh, between the individuals uh, that have been involved uh, in such activities uh, that have been uncovered historically. And we can see that the portrait of the, cri of the criminal uh, has changed over time, uh, well, uh, to this day, uh, 2022. So all of those, uh, Mr. Ross Ulbricht, uh, Mr. Galvalarius, and Mr. Alexander Cazes uh, are educated individuals, uh, well, in different fields. Uh, Mr. Kazes, for instance, uh, has had a degree in um, computer science. Uh, they tend to share mm, certain views, such as uh, being libertarian, uh, 
Uh, and this was something very much associated with the motives uh, of the founder of Silk Road, but it uh, uh, can uh, be uh, speculated about the other, me other members of that community. And uh, here, actually, in case with Mr. Alexander Kazes, the key input was an email address uh, that was uh, a source of messages to uh, newcomers uh, within uh, the Alpha Bay uh, marketplace, which was 10 times the size of Silk Road at its peak. Uh, the support emails to new vendors and new members. So here uh, we can try an example of enriching that identifier to build this graph from scratch. And this can be done uh, with the help of uh, something called a machine within Maltigo that can automate those queries uh, under a specific logic. So here at this moment, uh, it gives us an IP address uh, from a leak database. It gives us an account on Gravatar, weight loss uh, 666, an account on Skype, and a number of email addresses with similar passwords. And also a number of additional database records uh, that contain the email in the string. The IP address is, for, is further resolved into a Canadian net block, uh, and that is resolved to an autonomous system number. Now uh, we can try to do uh, the same with uh, the second email that we have here. This giving us two Skype accounts and two additional IP addresses. And of course, we can run a search into uh, the data lake of Darkal. from which we will try to extract additional details. Here, this gives us the family name. Uh, this gives us a name of another individual and a number of IP addresses uh, and phone numbers. Well, 
The, uh, the IP address thing may be uh, just a, a minor technical problem on uh, the side of social links <laughs> with uh, integrating this, uh, but uh, you get the point. So uh, while uh, this uh, gathering and uh, this, uh, well, some somewhat structuring process is something that is done in retrospect. So this uh, person has already been uncovered, already been arrested, and already committed suicide while in jail. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's quite obvious how uh, beneficial industrial automated tools such as Darkel and social links uh, can be in uh, researching such individuals and uh, investigating and doing criminal intelligence uh, uh, on, uh, well, within those types of sources. With uh, OxyMonster, uh, the alias uh, that belonged to Mr. Galvalarius, uh, an Israeli-French individual, the initial input point that the investigators had uh, was this vanity Bitcoin address. Uh, from which uh, they traced the out uh, the output, the outgoing transactions to a number of addresses, all uh, leading to an account on a peer-to-peer -peer platform, localbitcoins.com, under the username Valerius, and that is uh, exactly what uh, we were talking about when we said. Uh, speech patterns and idioms and idiosyncrasies. So the investigators uh, further uh, compared the speech of Mr. Galvalarius on Instagram and Twitter accounts that are no longer in existence, but we do have a Foursquare profile here um, with uh, that of the user OxyMonster. And uh, there was a certain match in the patterns. Now, here we can extract uh, additional things uh, from the dark owl entities that we have here as well. And in another example uh, with uh, an email of Mr. Russell Brecht, uh, which was found from the Bitcoin talk, uh, uh, from what, one of the posts on the Bitcoin talk forum, which was initially found uh, by a match in the username Altoid with uh, the first ever uh, mention of the, the Silk Road marketplace on shroomery.org. We can also try to uh, use those transforms to see what is connected to those identifiers. And uh, here we go to what is more commonly associated with uh, social links, with uh, social media intelligence being our strongest site so far, even though we've diversified the sources that we have and the methods available for them, is the standard procedure of mapping out of the digital footprint of an individual.
Now, uh, quite obviously, if we return to the initial logical schema of those processes, uh, it is a necessity to uh, use, um, to not just focus on the user account or on the group or on the marketplace within the Tor network or any of the other darknets. Uh, it, the uh, process of investigation and analysis will take the analyst uh, well, uh, if they're lucky, of course, into other kinds of domains, which uh, may include uh, conventional social media. There is uh, another instance uh, of uh, use of a potential use of uh, OSINT tools uh, on uh, a known case. Um, well, I mean, in a similar scenario, that is something that it would make sense to use, of course, uh, on the uh, Berlusconi market and their administrator here, uh, Giancarlo Rossino. So the way that uh, they have been uncovered uh, was something far more in line with the traditional work of law enforcement. They were eventually closed down as a result of the, an operation by the Italian Guardia di Finanza, uh, but it was a result of operatives uh, having ordered a number of goods as part of an experiment from the marketplace and uh, having noticed, having noted that they all came from uh, the same post station from within a small town in Italy. Uh, but here we see an example of what can potentially be found from the usernames and the accounts under those usernames uh, that were operated by Mr. Rusino. So there are two of them, uh, one uh, having presence in the Dread Forum, involved in discussions around the Berlusconi marketplace, and another one uh, on several marketplaces, including, of course, Berlusconi, two of those sharing a single PGP open key with the pattern of the goods being shipped from Italy worldwide. And there is some output that uh, we see here from uh, the social uh, the social links identity search engine that also gives us uh, a number of email addresses and IP addresses. And of course, operations such as this can be uh, advanced with uh, the use of dark owl as well. So that would be all on uh, my part so far with the functional demonstration of the capabilities. Uh, I think we can go uh, into uh, the section of answering questions. Will the recordings be made available to the participants? Yes, certainly. So uh, yes, uh, my colleague uh, has uh, launched a poll and we highly encourage you to answer those questions. The first one being, how likely are you to consider the dark web for investigations or for data breach monitoring for, on a scale from one to five? The second being, would more education around the dark web topic and how it relates to cybersecurity benefit your business? The third is, would you like to have a proof, a proof of concept of the usage of uh, social links professional uh, with uh, dark cal on uh, dark web research to see how it can help you in your work? The fourth, is your company currently accessing the dark web for threat intelligence or uh, digital risk protection and monitoring of brand reputation. And the fifth, does your company have a dedicated budget for purchasing an open source intelligence solution this year? Uh, yes, another topic which uh, we haven't really focused on today, but uh, which is quite relevant, I suppose, here. Uh, is uh, the usage of those kinds uh, of tools and the exploration and the research of those kinds of sources uh, by uh, uh, 
professionals in the fields of corporate security. So the cases that we've shown now, they're somewhat more in the domain of law enforcement work and uh, the work of law enforcement analysts and criminal intelligence analysts. Uh, but uh, the monitoring of uh, sources aggregating uh, leaked uh, leak databases, aggregating data breaches uh, are uh, also a topic quite relevant uh, to uh, the practice within the corporate sector. Have we used those tools to detect human trafficking? Uh, yes, Christopher, that's uh, a very good question. And there is an organization uh, that uh, we have done a webinar with previously uh, the Anti-Human Trafficking Intelligence Initiative and uh, uh, with uh, very brilliant, pe brilliant people working there uh, on uh, that area, uh, uh, such as Mr. Larry Cameron. And they have a solution of their own that works by a slightly different principle than uh, uh, social and dark owl. Uh, but yes, such solutions do exist and such practice does exist, and they have been successful uh, in uncovering numerous instances of uh, human trafficking uh, and the distribution of CSAM. Absolutely. And, and Ivan, I just want to jump in there and, and congratulate you on a, on a really excellent presentation. I know it's a complicated topic, but uh, it was really amazing what you did. But and I'll also add that as far as the the human trafficking piece, it's um, we, we are seeing a growth in the kind of communications and coordination uh, that happens on the dark net for human trafficking, uh, and even more broadly for for the CSAM types of materials. Um, I'd like to talk to one of the other questions that's been brought up. Uh, it talks about the the company is involved in ransomware incident response. Um, the the amount of chatter that, that, that we see, you know, happening on the dark net uh, for the various different ransomware gangs uh, has increased exponentially over the last two years. And it's an area that where we've tried to focus for quite some time. And we've really seen, you know, how well they have uh, taken their their software to market on that. And you can kind of see that ransomware as a service. Uh, programs being uh, proliferating uh, quite widely through the various different markets on the dark net. So um, as far as uh, identifying specific ransomware families, I think we have about 30 or 40 of them that we've already curated to include uh, what cipher they're using uh, when we first saw them appear on the dark net. And uh, you can even use it to gather some of the pricing data that you need. Yes, uh, thank you for that, David. And actually, one uh, of the things that it's quite easy to see, even, even from this simple graph uh, that is just a reflection uh, of uh, the current state of affairs in the, the cryptocurrency industry, and specifically in the Bitcoin ecosystem, uh, is that it is uh, very, very, very Wild West-esque at the moment. Uh, so ob uh, ob ob uh, the obvious pattern of a large number of interactions uh, with people involved in terrorism and uh, ransomware and uh, 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 the trades in illicit goods in uh, the dark web space and human trafficking and CSAM as well, although those two categories are not reflected here. Uh, the uh, people at the uh, Anti-Human Trafficking Intelligence Initiative know much more about uh, that topic, uh, interacting with legitimate exchanges uh, such as uh, Binance, uh, Gemini, and uh, Coinbase. Uh, so um, this does reflect the current situation to an extent. Okay. I'll take the question about the, uh, there's a question from Andrew about um, human. It says, do Dark Elm and social links have detect or crawl the deep and dark web? Um, yeah, we almost all of our collection is is technical automated. So, uh, and there's a combination uh, of techniques that you use to gain access. But then, you know, you cannot collect at scale uh, just using uh, just using human beings. So, uh, it's a combination of both. It's a good question, uh, but we do both for those kind of collections. Uh, and then there was one question there about. Uh, risk management, targeting, profiling, and customs control. Absolutely, uh, you know we're specifically uh, for the uh, for the drugs uh, portion of this. Uh, you're able to actually, you know, go ahead early on 
And because most of the drug shipments that we see happening on the dark net do happen, they're, they're international transactions, right? Like one of the, the, you know, the largest shippers of drugs worldwide is the United States Postal Service, right? Because it takes a federal warrant to get into that, into a box that's being shipped. And so, you know, you can do that. Uh, we see some law enforcement agencies uh, do controlled buys, like we use, use these tools to identify, okay, who are the vendors? How do you inter in, interact with them? And it's about the speed, right? How do you get ahead of this and then do controlled buys? And when it comes into your country, you'll figure out which one of your customs agents is on, on the take and, and taking bribes from people to let those, those packages in. So uh, it's both uh, useful for looking at the criminal activity and also from, um, from an internal uh, counterintelligence perspective as well. Yes, thank you for that, David. That was quite insightful. So, uh, yes, and uh, thank you, Mercha, for uh, visiting as well. Uh, we're always glad to see you here. And there is a question on uh, whether there is... Yes, uh, the, how about start working as a sales representative? So yes, Salman, if uh, you would be interested, well, depending on which, orga which organization and which field more, I suppose uh, you can uh, contact us in a standard way on uh, the email of either social links or Dark Owl. So uh, yes, we're waiting for uh, additional questions that uh, you guys may have for today's webinar as we have three minutes left at the moment. Sure, I'm sure we can put that slide back up, can't we, Ivan? We have our yeah, contact information yeah, on it. That's, uh, certainly. So yeah, uh, this is where you can contact either Social Links or Dark Al for potential further discussion and further cooperation. Andrew, we don't want to leave you hanging out there. I see your question. You've asked uh, two on it now about how they might could have seized uh, ransomware payments. Um, I don't have any direct knowledge of how that happened, but. You know, most of these payments have to go through some form of exchange to move the money around. And they you know, likely had access to one of those exchanges that could tell them. Because remember, there are some exchanges that are, you know, uh, working with and cooperating with law enforcement and international law enforcement agencies. And if they get a valid, you know, warrant from, from a law enforcement agency to block a transaction, uh, they can do that just like it would work in the international SWIFT system for uh, blocking bank transactions through the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So I would imagine it's, it's probably something like that is how it was done. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, I think there was uh, an Eastern European uh, mixing service there. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, that uh, does seem to make sense. So uh, yes, uh, this is it on our part for today. Uh, thank you everybody very much for participating. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, you will uh, contact us uh, to talk with us further how our solutions can be implemented into your business processes. And of course, we will be uh, uh, very glad to see you and we'll be expecting you on our uh, further webinars that are to come. Uh, thank you, and uh, we wish you all a good day. Uh, David, thank you for co-hosting. Thank you so time. much. Thank you so much. Awesome. It's been a great webinar. That was awesome. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah.